Hi, uh, welcome to Science Hangout from Science Mission. Uh, I'm Sadashiva Pai from Science Mission. We have today Dr. Subodas Gupta, assistant professor in oncology and stress biology from Roswell Park Comprehensive Center at Buffalo, New York. Dr. Das Gupta has published uh, almost uh, 20 research articles in reputed journals like Nature, Nature Communications, PNA, Cell Reports, etc. He has also won several awards and has been awarded uh, several research grants and is the reviewer in uh, several journals. Uh, welcome, Das Gupta. Thank welcome you so much. Hangout. Uh, can you please uh, tell us about yourself, your background, your education, etc.? Sure. So I I have a bachelor's uh, in uh, microbiology, chemistry, and zoology from Bangalore University in India, uh -huh. and I have a master's uh, in biochemistry from Department of Biochemistry, Panaras Hindu University in Varanasi, uh -huh. and. And uh, after, after finishing my master's, I had an opportunity to work for a year in uh, pharmaceutical industry. So I worked in Dr. Reddy's laboratories in Hyderabad, where I was, in, uh, I was involved in drug discovery research. And spending a year there, I, I joined my higher studies at uh, University of North Texas Health Science Center at Fort Worth, Texas. So mm -hmm. I got a PhD from UND Health Science Center in 2010. And then after that, I joined uh, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas uh, to do my postdoctoral stu uh, studies. And after finishing my postdoctoral studies, I was a, a junior faculty in Baylor for, for a year. And then I moved to Roswell for Comprehensive Cancer Center where I started my independent lab. So uh, uh, it's been almost a year now I have uh, started my own lab. OK. And uh, tell me about your lab and the lab people. Uh, you can tell a little bit more about that. That would be good. So uh, right now, you know, after I started here, I have been very fortunate to to attract a lot of young and uh, dynamic and self-motivated people to my lab. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are still growing. And <clears throat> so far, it's been a wonderful journey. Uh, I have one postdoctoral fellow uh, who is working in the lab right now. Uh, then I have uh, uh, one graduate student who officially joined the lab. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she is going to star uh, she's she's going to do her thesis work in my lab and then i have <coughs> excuse me and then i have a research technician uh, uh, he he is kind of managing the lab as well as doing a lot of science uh, and then i have a couple of students who are rotating in the lab right now so so far we are almost like four people in the lab okay and uh, do you have like you have a very like long uh, research uh, career, of course, like it is grad student, postdoc, and all those things. Uh, can you please talk about some of the mentors who helped you in your career, in your research, and all? Absolutely. So uh, this 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 has been you know this is something which is very important as you ask because your interest kind of develops when you're a student. And uh, my interest developed when I was an undergrad in Bangalore University. And I was, you know, after a few, few years, maybe in the first year, you still are kind of exploring what you want to do in your life and all those options. But then, you know, suddenly um, uh, you realize that you, you study something and then you find that, oh, I'm so interested in this. So my interest started right away at that time when I, I was taught by a very, very, uh, a very, very talented teacher, Miss Shija. Uh, uh, she took a microbi microbi uh, microbiological biochemistry class when, when I was in my second year. Mm -hmm. And I, once I, I kind of went over the fundamental biochemistry pathways or metabolic pathways, I was so attracted to it 
that even now, you know, it's almost like probably that class was a lecture was taken in 2000 when I was a student in the year 2000. Now it's like almost 18 years. My love has grown bigger and bigger that now my whole lab is working on that. So, uh, so it, it, it has been fascinating. And, and in my second year of uh, uh, undergrad, I, I realized that I'm going to study biochemistry because I was so, so fascinated by those metabolic enzymes, pathways, and and so I decided my master's is going to be in biochemistry. And and I, I really owe it to Ms. Shija, who, uh, who kind of taught that class in undergrad. And after that, I, I just went ahead uh, in my third year well, when I was finishing my undergrad to kind of only study biochemistry, masters in biochemistry. Oh, you can realize at that time, biotechnology is kind of like hot. Everybody wants to study bi biotechnology. People were going like to all the different institutes to give uh, uh, entrance tests, but I was focused that I want to do biochemistry. And I was very lucky and fortunate uh, to uh, crack the entrance at BHU Biochemistry. And I, <clears throat> joined BHP Biochemistry for my master's. And it was a very short uh, pool of students who, who were actually admitted into that institute. And, um, and there, you know, it was fascinating because at that time I have like my whole two years on biochemistry. And uh, I, I recall a lot of lectures which then shaped me up. Like it's more deep, more mechanistic and how you know, and there are so many things to do. And uh, uh, lectures from Dr. Srivastava, lectures from Dr. Rathor, lectures from Dr. Dubey, you know, those are the lectures which kind of prepared you. And at the time, I, I was kind of like uh, almost destined that, yes, I'm going to study biochemistry. I want to go into the metabolic pathways. But I was not sure, like, how to shape up my research, right? But uh, a short stint in the industry where also I worked on uh, drug discovery for metabolic disorders, which is kind of on biochemistry and, and the pathways. And that shaped me up that there are so many biochemical or metabolic enzymes and pathways that kind of integrates into your fundamental health system. And if there is any problem in those, it kind of changes and, and uh, results in a lot of diseases. So, so um, and, and then I was fascinated by all those things. And when I entered my graduate school, I, I, was, uh, I was looking kind of trying to go into a lab where I can work on those areas. Um, I don't know whether it's uh, fortunately or unfortunately, but I did not study too much of biochemistry in my PhD, but I focused mostly on, on, on oncogene and, and cancer progression. Uh, but I always kept on reading literatures and things like that. So in Dr. J.K. Vishwanatha's lab, who was my graduate mentor at UND Health Science Center at Fort Worth, I, I kind of explored in many different areas. I, I did work on a lot of things, but the biggest uh, finding from those was kind of where we identified a novel oncogene. Uh, the, the oncogene was uh, named as chromosome 17 or 37 at the time. So there was not an official gene name given. And I was so fascinated as a young graduate student that let's find out the function of this gene. And uh, it took us a long, but at, uh, finally we were able to crack it out and found that this gene is involved in, in migration and invasion of cancer cells. And from there, you know, it was uh, uh, it was really interesting because then after our papers came out, we were able to uh, change the name of the gene because based on the function, now the gene is named as MIN1, which is Migration in, uh, Invasion Enhancer Protein. So uh, you can see like how your basic discovery kind of changes the whole field. But my interest and my passion of biochemistry still remained. And I was, at the time, being trained in cancer biology. I thought, how about working on cancer metabolism, an area which was, at the time, kind of evolving. Uh, a lot of interesting papers coming out from outstanding labs. And as a senior graduate student, I was kind of very, very interested to see 
how these uh, this pathways kind of now can cross up with oncogenes. So it's more of studying the biochemistry of the tumor cells. Um, so that's what I did in my postdoc. I went to an outstanding lab, uh, Dr. Bert O'Malley, uh, National Medical of Science uh, laureate, and he has been, uh, uh, you know, he has received all the awards you can imagine. And it was it was fascinating experience uh, for me to be working so closely with him. And even now, like for six to seven years there, and it changed my life because I kind of, uh, you know, when you're a postdoc, you know the experiments, you know the techniques, you know the things, but you still don't know which science or which project is kind of like a high impact story. Which is the thing that you want to study and which are the things are, are important for mankind or for the field, okay? And that training was outstanding with work. And I, 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 I have been very fortunate that I have been in that lab for so long and been trained and and got uh, the right uh, you know and not only just the training but also your mental aspect where you have to be very strong and where you have to be always kind of self motivated passion towards science and that's fascinating so as you can see i have so many mentors all through my life from my undergrad to my postdoc training and even now my chair uh, who is my mentor because when you start your own lab you you have to give it to your uh, people who are helping you. And I have Dr. Andre Goodkov, a renowned scientist who is my chair in the department, and a lot of other people in Roswell who are uh, very, very, very helpful. So mentors are, are pillars of your success, you know, because uh, with their, their, they have seen the world in so many different ways. And, and their, their, their strategies and their ideas, their guidance kind of shapes you. But it's not always that the mentors kind of help you. You have to kind of work with them and you have to take whatever they're saying and then kind of apply that. So from now on, I think it's my time to give it back to the students, whatever I have learned from my mentors. And, and it's it's been outstanding so far in the graduate education and things like that. And, and my mission is to, you know, just try to help the students out the way I have been helped by others and other mentors. And, and hopefully we can create a lot of young, talented scientists who will take the science further. Good. And uh, you talked about all these metabolism, cancer, and all those things. I saw your recent papers and all those things, which was very interesting. So let's go back and... Uh, see your presentation and if you can help us understand what you are doing in the lab, that would be really great. Sure, absolutely. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk very briefly about, uh, as you mentioned, a recent paper that came out in Nature. And I'm going to talk over it and kind of show you what the things we are planning to do now. Go ahead. Okay? Go ahead. All right. <clears throat> All right, so can you see the presentation? Yeah. All right, wonderful. So uh, so I'm going to talk about transcriptional control of tumor metabolic adaptations. So as, as I told you that metabolic adaptations are, are occurring in the tumor cells. And this is kind of a field where you can see that the basic biochemical pathways that are present in every every cell in our body, uh, but in tumor cells, these pathways are altered. Okay, so these pathways are now uh, are now kind of uh, uh, changed in a way that allows the tumor cells uh, to succeed not only in generating a tumor, a primary tumor, but also spreading it to different organs. A process which is called uh, tumor metastasis. All right, so, but as you know that the tumor, the cancer progression process is, is a long process. It is, it has many different steps. It has many different mechanisms. And each, each step is very important for a tumor cell to succeed and survive in our body. 
So if you look into the primary tumor here, where you have a lot of tumor cells, and but very few cells are able to come out of the primary tumor cells, uh, invade through the extracellular matrix, which is our tissues, and kind of reach the uh, blood vessels uh, where the tumor cells then uh, and intravasate. And in the circulation, the tumor cells survive, and only very few tumor cells are able to come out of the blood vessel and then grow in different organs. So here is a process which we are calling as a successful tumor metastasis. Now, what are the things that allows the tumor cells to survive this whole process? And if you look into that, uh, all throughout this process from primary tumor to forming a successful mets, you have the tumor cells. The most important, important thing the tumor cells need is uh, to, uh, energy, okay? And it's kind of like where you can see that the energy is the powerhouse of the tumor cells on which you have all the different processes of survival, adaptation, growth, proliferation, and finally, if they succeed in all of those, then the tumor spreads to metastasis. That's the spreading to different organs. Now, if you want to target, and, and just, just a clinical aspect of it, uh, most of the diseases, uh, most of the different types of tumors that we have in the clinics now, uh, metastasis is the killer because this is the, this is the form of cancer that is uh, causing a lot of mortality. So we, we, we definitely need to uh, come up with a solution that we can use to block tumor metastasis. So I kind of put here a, a very popular game, which is called Zenga, where you know, if you want to uh, win this game, you, you have to kind of somehow dislodge the base. And if your base is very strong, it's very hard to uh, break this apart, okay? And uh, in, in tumor cells or in this uh, strategy where you have, uh, if, if you kind of devise a strategy to block tumor metastasis, I think it's very important to attack the tumor metabolism, which is kind of giving you the energy or the ATP required for the cancer cells to survive. So how we do that? Now, if we come back to these different stages or different process, of the cancer progression and metastasis, the requirement for metabolism is not always the same. If you look into the primary tumor where the tumor cells are kind of growing all the time, it's kind of trying to build up a, a, a big chunk of tumor, which is, we call it as a primary tumor. Now this primary tumor, uh, in this process of primary tumor formation, the anabolic pathways are very important for the tumor cells. That's, that means it's kind of building up. But once the tumor cell leaves or some of the tumor cells are able to leave this primary tumor in way and enter into the, uh, into the cancer metastasis uh, and, and then enter into the blood vessels, then the tumor cells uh, uh, may not need that much of uh, energy may not need that much of anabolic processes to build up anymore. But uh, what is being thought that in this stage, the tumor cells need to survive. So they will, they will make some energy and they will try to survive and fight out all the different parameters that our human body has, like immune cells, apoptotic factors, and so forth, and so that they can survive. And then finally, few tumor cells are able to grow in different organs like lungs, liver, or bone, where the tumor has now spread from the primary tumor, either it's a breast cancer, prostate cancer, or any different types of cancer. Now you have it in your major organs of the lungs, liver, and bone. Then again, in this stage, uh, the tumor cells have to change their machinery, uh, their biochemical pathways, so that they can grow inside these uh, foreign organs, inside this different organs where they did not originate. So in this stage, you need to have this adaptation where the tumor cells can alter itself in a way that can use the, the nutrients 
or the resources available in this site. So what makes these tumor cells so much versatile that it, it can alter the metabolic requirements uh, as it passes from the primary tumor to forming uh, aggressive metastatic disease. And we think that there are certain different ways that we can explain this uh, phenotype or this mechanism. Um, there, there are many different types of signaling, uh, cell signaling processes that takes place. One of the traditional one is what we know in the literature or what we know in the, uh, in the textbooks that we have a growth factor or a hormone which binds to the receptors which activates the kinases of the signaling molecules. And these molecules then activate the transcriptional regulators which turn on genes and if these are metabolic genes then you have an increase in the tumor metabolism. But what we think is that in this process of uh, cancer progression, uh, there may be certain, certain uh, different aspects to it where the nutrients or the metabolites which are available for the, by the tumors are available for the tumors when they're in different sites for, for example, in the primary site, it's in the circulation or in the, the different organs, these nutrients kind of acts as the uh, uh, acts as a signaling molecule, which then stimulates various sensors in the tumor cells. Now, these sensors can be activated by this nutrient signaling uh, using protein modifications, enzyme activations, epigenetic marks, and this activation of the sensors kind of leads to the activation of the genes or the metabolic enzymes, which are required uh, to utilize the nutrients that kind of act as signal. So you can see here, there is a very specific uh, way of enhancing the transcription of genes which are required to utilize that nutrient. And this process gives you a lot of uh, benefits because you don't want to turn on genes which are not required at the time. And you want to turn on genes that are very specifically required for utilizing that nutrient. Suppose you have glucose here, if the blue is glucose, you will turn on genes that are required to metabolize glucose. But if you have amino acids or other uh, nutrients such as fatty acids, you will turn on enzymes that are required to utilize that. So cancer cells, I, I believe, and, and there are a lot of literature coming out so far from many different labs, which kind of shows that this metabolic signaling theory uh, which which is very very uh, important in cancer cells. So when when I uh, when, what so what we are doing in in our lab. So we are asking very fundamental research questions in our lab. We we want to understand the role of this nutrient signaling in transcriptional activation. We want to understand what are the different types of nutrients that can activate the transcription of specific genes. We are very interested to understand how this metabolic signaling uh, sets the stage for metabolic rewiring. That means how this signaling aspect or how the nutrients alters the metabolic uh, metabol metabolic pathways in the tumor cells. And most importantly, how this metabolic rewiring or switches are regulated uh, in uh, so that a tumor cell progresses to the metastasis stage. All tumors did not doesn't progress uh, to metastasis. So some tumors do progress, some don't. So are, are there metabolic switches? Are there some metabolic checkpoints which allows uh, the tumors to be more aggressive? And, and we are very interested to understand this. All right. So when I was a, a postdoc in Bordomali's lab at Baylor College of Medicine, we were very interested in understanding a molecule which is called a steroid receptor coactivated 3. So these are molecules which binds to the transcription factors on nuclear receptors. And when they bind, they activate the genes or they can sometimes repress the genes. And, and we were very interested to study this molecule called steroid receptor coactivated 3 or SRC3. Uh, please don't confuse it with SART kinase. That's a different molecule. So it is NCOA3 or SRC3. And uh, previous studies from the lab has shown that this molecule is very important 
in breast cancer or mammary gland development. It cooperates with uh, oncogenes like uh, hard 2 neo also known as ERBB2, in uh, generating uh, resistant uh, tumors, breast tumors. Uh, it's one of the most important molecule if you want to look into the estrogen response driven breast tumor genesis. And most importantly, we were uh, in the lab, uh, Bird's lab previously found that this molecule is heavily modified uh, in, 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 and by post-translational modifications, particularly by kinases. And this modification kind of allows the this molecule uh, SRC3 to bind very specifically to transcription factors and activate gene transcription. So uh, we were interested and we were trying to identify the mechanisms and how and the strategies that can be used to block SRC3 in cancer so that we can come up with a, a strategy that can be utilized in patients. Now, as I said, that SRC3 is heavily phosphorylated by kinases. And so we thought that targeting SRC3 alone may not be very helpful, but if we block SRC3 and kinases together, that may give us a better effect to block breast cancer. So we need to know the kinases that modify this SRC3, so this phosphorylation of SRC3 can be blocked. And if that is blocked, then the molecule will not be able to turn on the genes. So that was a very, uh, very, very uh, uh, basic strategy or in a layman term that we thought of doing. So it's important for us to know all the kinases or the most important kinases which activates SRC3 by phosphorylating it so that it turns on the genes. And if we can find that kinase, we can block it together. So I started on this project in a different if in a different way because since we need to know all the kinases uh, that are important for uh, kinases that are important for phosphorylating SRC3, I started with the library screen. Uh, so this is an unbiased way of looking into all the kinases that is phosphorylating SRC3. So I used a human kin kinome library. So the human kin kinome library consists of 636 human kinases. Excuse me. And 636 human kinases are so far known in our field. And so we had all the different kinases. And then we, we used a library which contains uh, small interfering RNAs or siRNAs targeting each kinases. And we had three different siRNAs for each kinase. So you can imagine we had almost 2,200 siRNAs that we have to screen and identify which one of them, which of the kinases is regulating SRC3 activity. So I set up the uh, library screen using, using a couple of different approaches. And I'm going to talk about the first approach that we did. The first one, we used a couple of different plasmids. So we use uh, a GAL4 DNA binding domain, which is uh, a short uh, molecule, which is fused to SRC3. And that allows SRC3 to be, uh, to kind of bind to the GAL4 binding sites, which is present in a reporter plasmid. So we have either the GAL4 DNA binding uh, fused with SRC3, or we have the reporter plasmid, which contains GAL4 binding sites. So what happens is the GAL4 DNA binding domain and SRC3 uh, is fused protein kind of binds here. And once this binding occurs, you will see a uh, reporter activity of luciferase. Now, when we are throwing these plasmids or transfecting these plasmids inside the cells, they will be phosphorylated by different kinases. And, and if we use specific siRNA against that kinase, then the phosphorylation will be blocked. And that will result in an increase or decrease in the luciferase activity. So we use this uh, screening strategy to identify which kinase enhances SRC3 activity or which represses SRC3 activity. And this is the accumulative data from the, uh, from the screen. And you can see that we had many different kinases. These are the kinases when blocked or when knocked down or ablated, the SRC3 activity is going up. And these are the kinases when 
the block the SRC3 activity is going down. And among them, one of the most prominent kind is or one of the most significant, uh, uh, which significantly downregulated SRC3 activity was PFK before. So we wanted to study what this kind is, what this kind is, is doing, and what uh, it is, what's its role, and how it is regulating SRC3 activity. So what is PFKP4? So PFKP4 is a metabolic enzyme. It is, it's not a traditional protein kinase. It's a metabolic enzyme, but it has very unique features. It's one of the uh, few molecules that we have that has both a kinase domain, which transfers the phosphate group, but it also has a phosphorus domain, which kind of takes out the phosphate group. So the kinase and the phosphorus goes uh, opposite direction. So a kinase phosphorylates a protein, uh, phosphorylates dephosphorylates a protein. And this molecule has both these domains together. Okay, and here it's showing you have the kinase domain, uh, sorry, this is a phosphorus domain, and here you have the kinase domain. Traditionally, PFKB4 functions as a regulator of glycolysis. Okay, glycolysis is a process where glucose is being used up in the, in the cells, and it, it, forms, uh, it, it makes some energy, that's ADP molecules, and converts the glucose into pyruvate. Now, what PFKB4 does is PFKB4 converts fructose 6-phosphate, one of the intermediates of the pathway, into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And this fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is produced in a very small amount, which, which kind of activates this molecule or the enzyme called PFK1 or phosphofructokinase. So if you have this, if, the, if you have this metabolite fructose 2,6-bisphosphate produced by PFK before, it will keep this pathway uh, activated all the time so that all the glucose which has been taken up by the cells is being utilized and metabolized all right and once you you uh, if glucose is being utilized or taken up you form a lot of energy and once the energy is is restored then what happens is the phosphatase domain of pfk before right here is activated which then breaks this molecule fructose 2 6 bisphosphate back into fructose 6-phosphate. So there is a very nice regulation of how much glucose to be used, how much energy is to be used, needed, and once the energy is restored, then the process is stopped. And PFK before kind of plays a very uh, important regulatory part in this, in this metabolic uh, pathway. Now the question is why we are seeing this molecule uh, regulating a transcriptional coactivity. So we first wanted to make sure what we found from the screen is correct. So we use different uh, strategies. First, uh, SHRNA strategy to knock down PFK before. We use two different SHRNAs, 9 and 20, and we can see that we have been able to block PFK before. When we block PFK before expression, we found that uh, SRC3 activity or the transcriptional activity or the intrinsic transcriptional activity is reduced. Once this is reduced, so we can say what we found from the screen is correct. When you knock down PFK before, there is a decrease in the activity. What happens if we do the reverse? That means if we overexpress PFK before uh, it using uh, adenovirus of PFK before, so we use two different doses of adenovirus. Now you can see there is a very limited overexpression, and now you have a very high overexpression of PFK before. And when we do that, we can see the activity of PFK before is increased as well. So, so both either you knock down activity of SRC3 is going down. If you overexpress, you can restore back the activity. Most importantly, what we found also is that when you overexpress PFK before, there is a sudden increase in the SRC3 protein level. Okay, and and we knew from our past studies in Bird's lab that this is mostly because of post-translational modifications as we don't see any changes in the mRNA. So it's mostly in the translational level. So there must be some modifications which is allowing the protein to be highly stable. And that's the reason its protein level is increased. So we wanted to see how PFK before is regulating this activity of SRC3 and how it is regulating the protein level. A very nice paper came out from Jason Chesney's lab uh, and where they showed that the PFK before 
uh, has a kinase activity, okay? Uh, they use a recombinant PFKB4 or PFKB3, another isoform, and they show that the PFKB4 has a, a, a kinase Vmax of 5.06, okay? And if they compare the kinase to bisphosphatase, uh, the phosphatase activity, and they found the PFK before has 4.3, that is more of a kinase activity than the phosphatase. And the most importantly for us, it is like the recombinant PFK before has activity. So if you make recombinant PFK before enzyme, and they, then we can study what it is doing to SRC3. So we we exactly did what uh, what we I just said. So we we uh, mimic the enzymatic reaction that PFKB4 uh, entails in the uh, inside the cells. So it converts fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, and then it cleaves back the fructose 2,6-bisphosphate back into fructose 6-phosphate using its phosphatase. So we, we mimic this reaction in vitro in a test tube where we added fructose 6-phosphate, we added ATP. So these are the molecules needed for its enzymatic action. And then in this in, in this situation, in this in this condition, we added PFK before enzyme, because so that's the recombinant enzyme, and then we threw SRC3 purified protein because we want to see what it does to SRC3 as well. And and then after the incubation, we ran the gels and we found that uh, in presence of PFK before, so here you have an increasing uh, concentration of the PFK before enzyme we found that the SRC3 is phosphorylated. Now, we have probed it, this with an antibody which recognizes uh, both phosphorylated serine and threonine residues. So we can see increasing the concentration of PFK before in the enzyme reaction, we can see there is an increase in the phos SRC3 phosphorylation. So if this is the case, then the question is how SRC3 is how PFK before is regulating this phosphorylation, and and what are the uh, steps on that? So to identify that, we need to understand well, which is the phosphate donor. Is the fructose six phosphate the phosphate donor, or it's the ATP is the phosphate donor? So we did a, a similar experiment, but here we either added fructose six phosphate or ATP or combination of both. And we found that if we add just the fructose 6-phosphate, there is not much change uh, with the increasing concentration of fructose 6-phosphate. It's kind of like the basal level. But once we add ATP and at an increasing concentration, we found there is an increase in the phosphorylation of SRC3. And if we add both of them, we don't see any additive effect. In fact, at a higher dose of fructose 6-phosphate, which is one millimeter, we found there is a decrease in the ATP uh, SRC3 phosphorylation. So what it suggests to us that uh, the fructose 6-phosphate is displacing SRC3 from PFK before, suggesting fructose 6-phosphate and SRC3 are competing for the phosphorylation by PFK before. And, and this suggests that SRC3 may be a substrate of PFK before, and it can compete with other known substrate like fructose 6-phosphate. So well, the most important finding is that ATP is the phosphate donor. So ATP is donating the phosphate to SRC3. So to confirm that finding, we used now a radio labeled ATP, which is uh, the gamma phosphate of the ATP is labeled with P32. And we performed the similar experiment. And now we can see that indeed at an increasing concentration of PFK before, the P32, which is the gamma P32 of the ATP, is now transferred into PFKB4 protein, and you can see there is an increase in PFKB4 phosphorylation. So these experiments kind of confirm that indeed PFKB4 in certain situations can phosphorylate SRC3 uh, using the, a the phosphate group of ATP. So now the question is where it phosphorylates. SRC3 is a big protein. We need to identify the sites where, where it phosphorylates SRC3. So what we did was we used uh, different fragments of SRC3. So SRC3 has various protein, protein domains. And we used those domains. Uh, we we, uh, we uh, uh, generated recombinant domains of each of those fragments of SRC3, and then we used them in the similar reaction that I showed. 
And then we found that only one domain, and that is the, uh, uh, the CID domain or the CBP interacting domain is being phosphorylated by SRC3. So this domain is where the PFK before is phosphorylating SRC3. And that's why you see this band coming up when you do the reaction with P32. So we, this domain uh, is right here. So what we did was we performed a, a mass spectrometry where a proteomics approach, where you can see which, which of the amino acids in this domain is being phosphorylated by PFK before. And we found a strong peak uh, on, on serine 857 side. So there is a serine residue at the 857 uh, side of, uh, of this domain. And we found this, this side is being phosphorylated by PFK before. <clears throat> now, if you want to confirm that this is the side being phosph phosphorylated by PFK before, then what we can do is we can mutate this serine to alanine, and then we should not see any phosphorylation. And that's what we did. Uh, we mutated this side to alanine as the arrow points out. And when we do that, we saw that there's no phosphorylation. So this confirmed that serine 57 side of SRC3 is being phosphorylated. And there's only one side. So this made our life much easier so that we can then study what it does and what's the function of this phosphorylation on SRC3. <clears throat> now, previously, uh, also one paper from previous lab has also found that this site may be phosphorylated by another kind of scholar 3 and that kind of suggested, and this study suggested that it can, uh, uh, this phosphorylation may be linked to metastasis. So we knew that this site is very important. So, so first we wanted to study whether this site is important for SRC3 transcriptional activity. And when we used, uh, uh, since uh, PFK before is activated by glucose, we use different uh, concentration of glucose, either five or 25 millimolar. And we found that when we have more amounts of glucose in the cell, which will activate PFK before, and we found that this RC3 activity goes up. Now, if we, if we block PFK before and then give high amounts of glucose, the activity of SRC3 suppress, suggesting this uh, that PFK the glucose dependent increase in SRC3 activity is regulated by PFK before. Uh, we, if we also use uh, PFK before uh, knockdown, but then we use uh, uh, <coughs> uh, PFK before uh, mutant, and then we can see that clearly that the mutant uh, is also. Uh, suppressive to this activity. So if you have the 857A mutant, you can see that this, this does not in, increase the activity, suggesting then that the 857 site phosphorylation is very important. All right. So uh, basically, if you, this, uh, this is the two important findings that in presence of glucose, the activity of SRC3 increases, which is dependent on PFK before. If you mute at this site to 857A, then you, you don't see the phosphorylation. <clears throat> All right. Now, then what we did was, if what happens if you, if you make a mimic, that is 857E, which kind of mimics the charges, and then we find that indeed this was, uh, this this site now can increase the activity of SRC3. So the next question that we wanted to study is what are the domains in in PFK before that are important for regulating this function? And what we knew from the literature uh, that there are certain sites which is G46. P48 and G51, these are the sites which is important for ATP binding. And when we mutated this to alanine, we found the phosphorylation on SRC3 significantly reduced. All right. So this suggests again that the phosphorylation on SRC3 is dependent uh, on the PFK before binding to the ATP because that's the molecule which is donating the phosphor. And this again correlates with the PF SRC3 activity. So if you have a mutated PFK before, now you don't see the SRC3 activity being increased. Whereas when you have a wild type PFK before, you can see the SRC3 activity is increased. 
So not, next, we wanted to study whether uh, PFKB4 can also regulate the estrogen signal in the similar way. And we found, indeed, when PFKB4 uh, is or in presence of glucose, the activity of SRC3 increases uh, by PFKB4. But if we're not done SRC3, the ER activity goes down. So this suggests that uh, uh, SRC3 uh, phosphorylation by PFKB4 is important for its activity in ER positive tumor cells as well. And this also correlates very nicely with the growth curve. So if you have not done SRC3, you don't see the tumor cells growing. If you have the uh, re-express the wild types SRC3, you can rescue the tumor cell growth. But if you have a mutant 857A, you don't see much of growth. So suggesting again the 857A, 857 site phosphorylation is important for the tumor cell survival. Next, we wanted to see what happened to SR, uh, SRC3 when it is stimulated with glucose. And since uh, PFKB4 is regulating the glucose enzyme, we stimulated the tumor cells with different concentrations of glucose, either 5 millimolar or 25 millimolar. And we found the phosphorylation on the serine 857 significantly increased when, when you have uh, 25 millimolar or high amounts of glucose. And if you withdraw this glucose, so WD stands for withdraw, and if you withdraw the glucose, the phosphorylation is reduced. Or if you knock down PFK before, the phosphorylation now is gone. So this suggests that uh, tumor cells, which are dependent on high amounts of glucose, they will have an increase in PFK before activity. This will phosphorylate SRC3, and this will increase the transcriptional activity. So the question then comes, what's the functional significance? what are the target genes, how it regulates this activity, and then what it causes, and whether this pathway is important for cancer preparation. So we performed a metabolomics experiment where we tried to identify all the common uh, metabolites that are changed by PFK before SRC3, and we found uh, uh, very surprisingly that majority of the metabolites that are changed both by PFK before SRC3 uh, are, are related to the molecules that are important for DNA synthesis. So these are called purines. And the purines are the molecules which are important for DNA synthesis. And when we looked into this pathway, we found that indeed the purine synthesis is kind of connected with glucose or glycolytic pathway. And when we looked into the different enzymes and we found there are three important enzymes that are regulated by PFK before SRC3 signaling, which fits nicely into this pathway. So that suggests that this molecule, this this, sig this uh, important uh, crosstalk between uh, metabolic enzyme and the transcriptional co-regulator is uh, regulating the flow of the glucose from uh, glycolytic pathway into the purine biosynthesis. All right, and and that may be important for the tumor cells to survive and grow in different stages, either during the uh, adaptation stage or during the survival stage. So th uh, this is a this is little bit very important experiment where we try to confirm this hypothesis that the glucose carbons are actually regulated by PFK before to enter into the purines. So what we did was we, we checked whether the PFK before is regulating this glucose flow into the uh, into the uh, into the purine synthesis, and this takes place by a metabolic pathway which is called as pentose phosphate pathway or PPP. So we used uh, glucose which is leveled at the uh, sixth position. So we call them as six C thirteen glucose. And if that happens, the cells will then uh, take up the glucose, utilize it, and you will have the uh, pentose phosphate pathway intermediate ribose five phosphate level at the fifth position, all right? So now when we knocked down PFK before, now we are seeing that the ribulose 5-phosphate C30 incorporation is significantly decreased. So suggesting that when you don't have PFK before, the flow from here to here is blocked, all right? So that suggests that the glucose carbon is entering here uh, with the help of PFK before. And this glucose carbon then over the time will enter into the purines where now we, if we measure adenosine, one of the products, and we found that indeed the carbon incorporation into the adenosine, which is coming from glucose, 
is, is significantly decreased when you don't have PFKB4. So PFKB4 uh, re uh, regulates a very important uh, <coughs> flow of the glycolytic flux into the pentosphosphate pathway leading to the synthesis of purines. And then we looked into how PFKB4 and SRC3 together can regulate the, uh, regulate the gene transcription. So we found that there are certain sites where PFKB4 binds, and we found that this binding uh, overlaps with the transcription factor called ATF4, and, and uh, this site is present in all the genes that we identify are important for the purine synthesis. So now XDHT, KT, and MPD1 has all those binding sites where ATF4, this uh, transcription factor can bind, and the binding of the transcription factor overlaps with SRC3 binding right here, suggesting that SRC3 and ATF4 together can regulate this transcription factor uh, and transcription of genes. So, so we first studied whether ATF4 and, and phosphate SRC3 interacts, and we found indeed uh, in high glycolytic conditions, we have uh, increased in the uh, binding of ATF4 with phosphate SRC3 and when you don't have PFK before, this binding is reduced. So suggesting clearly that the uh, phosphorus RC3, which is the active molecule regulating the transcription uh, function of SRC3, is interacting with the transcription factor ADF4. And this binding is also found uh, on the chromatin. So this is a cheap experiment where we found that in, in presence in, 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 in high amounts of glucose, which is driving this pathway, there is an increased occupancy of ATF4 on the promoter of one of the target genes in transketolase and the increase in, in the phosphate RC3 recruitment of the promoter. So this is kind of uh, shown here in the schematic. So you have increased amounts of glucose uptake by the tumor cells. PFKB4 is activated in phosphorus SRC3. SRC3 then goes to the nucleus where it, it's, in the, it's in the chromatin, it binds and interacts with ADF4, which we are showing here, and they together then uh, regulate the transcription of the genes, which is important for synthesis of purines. So for how this pathway is important in breast tumor progression. So we use mouse model here, where we injected the breast tumor cells in the mammary fat pad of the mouse, uh, and then after six weeks, we, we found that the tumors have grown bigger. So what we did was we took out the primary tumor out uh, using a surgery in the mouse and allowed the animals to survive. And then after four weeks of the surgery, so four weeks post-surgery, then we tried to see the mouse and see whether any tumor cells have been able to create metastasis in different organs. So we focused mostly on the lungs because uh, these animals uh, get uh, lung metastasis very quickly. So this was our strategy to see whether uh, if this happens, what is the importance of PFKB4 and SRC3 in this process? And so if you look into the primary tumor, when we have knocked down SRC3 or PFKB4, the primary tumors isolated from mouse are very, very less, very smaller. And when you overexpress SRC3, the tumors grow bigger. And if you, if you have a mutant that is a serine 857 mutant, then you see the tumors are very small. So this suggests clearly that the PFKB4 and SRC3 are very important for forming the primary tumor genesis. And the 857 site phosphorylation is critical uh, for this pathway. Next, we then focused on the second part, that is after we resected the primary tumors out, we waited and tried to see what happens uh, to the uh, uh, to to the animals whether they are getting any meds or not, and then after four weeks when we looked into the lungs, this is a bioluminescence imaging. So our tumor cells have been labeled with uh, luciferase, and we can see clearly that the wild type tumors with SRC3 there is an increase in lung meds, and as shown in pathology here. And when we have a mutant 857A or PFKB4 or SRC3 being suppressed or ablated, you don't see that niche of meds. You don't see much here in the bioluminescence. And pathology, we do see some small nodules, but uh, uh, very, very less compared to the tumors that have wild type SRC3. 
So this is represented graphically here. So all these studies kind of suggest that the uh, phosphorylation of 857 site of SRC3 is very important. So we then looked into the primary tumor and tried to see uh, the, the animals which develop meds do they have uh, an 857 site phosphorylated? So we used an antibody which uh, recognizes the 857 site, and we can clearly see that the 857 site is heavily phosphorylated as recognized by the antibody, and they are mostly inside the nucleus. So because we know the 857 phosphorylation is important for gene transcription of chromatin, so we can see clearly the merge is showing us that they're mostly in the nucleus. And this is a human tumor growing inside the mouse, and the antibody specificity clearly shows that it is only picking up the tumor area, which is the human cells, not the mouse. So it shows you very nice specificity. And if you block SRC3, of course, you don't see. If you block the kinase, you also don't see the phosphorylation. So this clearly suggests that the tumors which were developed meds later on have an increased amount of phosphorylation of 857, uh, which is in the nucleus regulating the process of meds. <clears throat> so in a summary, what I have shown you is that glucose, uh, uh, which is the traditional glycolytic pathway here, glucose to pyruvate gives you energy. And here now we found there is certain changes in the tumor cells where a uh, critical regulator of, P, uh, of this pathway, PFKB4, is now activating transcription by phosphorating SRC3. This phosphorated SRC3 then binds to ATF4 and regulates transcription of genes, TKT, AMPD1, XH, and that allows the synthesis of purines. Purines are very important macromolecules required for the tumor cells to grow and survive. And as a result, you can see there is an increase in energy growth and proliferation in meds. So next, we try to identify what happens to the patients because it's important that whatever you find in the lab, it has to be somehow re related clinically. So we, we identified, uh, we, we, we got some tumor tissues from the normal, uh, from the tumors, uh, from the patient tumors. So these are the T represents the patient tumors and N represents adjoining normal tissues, okay? And we had like 14 patients, so seven here and seven here, so total 14. And we can see that mostly in the, the PFK before level is significantly elevated in the tumors compared to the adjoining normal areas, okay? Majority of the patients. And that correlates very nicely with, with the phosphorylation of SRC3. So this band showing here, the phosphorylation of SRC3 is increased when you have PFK before, kind of what we were, uh, we found from our study. And if we do a correlation of PFK before or the phosphorus RC3, we do see there is a nice correlation, uh, a, a clinical correlation. So this, these are, this is showing that in patient tumors as well, the PFK before, increase in PFK before increases the phosphorylation of SRC3. Similarly, we also found in, in another different types of uh, breast cancer, which is called triple negative breast cancer, that the patients which have uh, increased amount of PFK before or SRC together, which is shown here in red, their survival is very low. So the patients uh, don't uh, survive the treatment strategies and whatever, and the patients have a very poor survival. So they the, the mortality rate is really high if you have high amounts of PFK before SRC3, whereas the patients with low amounts of PFK before an SRC3, they tend to do better. So again, suggesting this, this, this pathway is very important for, for uh, the tumor cell survival. And if you can block this, so we probably will be able to shift this curve up there and the patients uh, may survive better. So that's what we are hoping. So, so in summary, what I have shown you here is that glucose and nutrients uh, activate this enzyme PFK before, which is a very, very important regulatory enzyme in the process of glycolysis. It phosphorylates SRC3, which we found, and this phosphorylation of SRC3 then drives a year positive tumors, which we have sh shown in the patients that they have high amounts of phosphorus SRC3 and PFK before, and it also regulates uh, uh, it, 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 with ATF4, it also drives 
target genes such as the purine synthesis genes. And all together, it promotes a best tumor progression, uh, tumor, primary tumor growth, and metastasis. So that is what we found here. All right. So with this, I'd like to thank the people uh, in my lab. This is my lab group. Uh, and then uh, a lot of help, uh, most of the work was done uh, when I was at Baylor and then uh, we finished the work when I moved to Roswell. Uh, and uh, thank to my mentor, Bardo Malley, all my collaborators and the funding sources. All right, with this, I'd like to uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about our recent findings. Thanks, thanks, Subha. Can you just, uh, I have a couple of questions if you don't sure. mind. No worries. Yeah, just stop sharing, so. Okay. It's a very, very nice presentation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, I have a couple of, you got in the list, right? During the screen, a bunch of molecules like came up. So, and from your eventual results that, okay, it is, uh, you can prevent the metastasis, but still you see in the histology, few things. That means like there is some alternative pathway also. So are you looking into other things in addition to what uh, you have done so far? Yes. <clears throat> so there are a couple of strategies and a couple of explanations for those answer. Uh, the first of all, uh, we have to, we are now trying to see whether there are other strategies that we can use to block this enzyme better. Mm -hmm. uh, genetic knockdowns, that the strategy that we used, we were able to knock down, but we were not able to completely knock down. There are some levels of PFK before there, which may be uh, resulting in some meds. Of course, there may be some other pathways. Um, uh, some uh, That's why we see the resistance uh, to many therapies. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. any new drug comes up, you say that the patients respond better, but over the time the disease comes down, but again, it relapses after a few, few years. And that is a big worry. So we are definitely looking into that. So we are looking into when we don't have PFK before, how the tumor cells um, tries to compensate the mechanism. Okay, so we are looking into that. We, we are also trying to do that. Uh, can, we, can we use uh, a combinatorial therapy with some other molecules which we know that works in the clinics. Uh, uh, you, in addition to PFK before SRC3 inhibitors, can we use those combinatorial therapies, okay? So we are looking into that in triple negative breast cancer, uh, looking into whether PFK before and SRC3 uh, uh, targeting those two molecules, can it better the chemotherapy effect? Because patients sometimes get resistant to chemotherapies so we are trying to see if we block this pathway, if we block the escape pathways of the tumors, can we now enhance the, uh, the, the, the treatment regimen specificity and the efficacy? Uh, I have one more last question. Yeah. Uh, uh, this uh, SRC, like the glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm. And as you have shown, SRC moves into the nucleus, right? For all the things, whatever, like uh, gene expression and all those things. So certainly you would have found some uh, translocation domain in SRC, nuclear translocation domain or anything. So would it be possible to block it so that it doesn't go into the nucleus to activate? Right. Yeah, this, this is a good question. This has been, this has been uh, um, I would say a lot of people have tried that, which is uh, since the coactivators are, um, important inside the nucleus to regulate gene expression, uh, is there a way that we can block it from entering the nucleus so that uh, the expression of target genes are, are not activated, okay? Uh, there's some problems with that. First of all, we still don't know whether if we muted this phosphorylation site, can we keep SRC3 in the uh, in the cytosol. That study has not been done yet, so we are definitely looking into it. Uh, now, the glycolytic expression, the glycolysis or, or the regulation of the glucose flow into the purines is mostly done by PFK before, not by SRC3. SRC3 is mostly kind of in the nucleus where it is regulating the transcription of the genes. Um, we, we definitely are trying to see where we have some uh, inhibitors in hand 
uh, actually the Malice lab has some inhibitors against SRC3, uh, which blocks in different types of tumors. So this is uh, exactly what we are trying to see, whether we can block SRC3 activity, you know, so that the transcription of the genes are repressed. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and effort. And I look forward to more of your uh, publications in the near future in uh, some of the reputed journals again. Well, thank you so much for having me here. It's a great opportunity to be talking to you, and I wish you all the best in this mission. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I'll uh, keep in touch with you, and it will be on our site uh, within the next uh, few minutes, basically, as soon as we are done. So I'll send you a link also. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Subha. Have a good day. Bye.